All right, good morning, Warhawks. This is Colonel Wilson. Welcome to episode 23 of Freeform Friday. I am joined here, uh, as always, with Chief Butcher. Chief, good morning. Happy good morning, Friday. Sir. And we are we have a special guest this morning. We have uh, Sergeant Klein, uh, military training instructor from the 321st Training Squadron this morning. Sergeant Klein, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Yeah, so Sergeant Klein is uh, one of our Warhawks of the Week this week, uh, doing some amazing work. So we wanted to feature him out here this morning. So. Um, for those at home, that, uh, that we, we get a lot of people that watch the, the free form uh, to include the, the folks and the parents, the family members of our trainees. For those family members, Sergeant Klein is one of the military training instructors that provides the training to your trainees, uh, to, your, <coughs> to your children or your family members as they come in here. So if you want to ask any questions to Sergeant Klein today about the training experience that, you're, uh, that your sons and daughters are going through, I'm sure he'd be happy to answer those questions with you. But, Hey, we want to talk a little bit first before we talk about that. Hold on, just one minute though. So I also want to make a point. We are in the 737 training group. This is the headquarters from basic military training. Uh, Colonel Bear Newsom, our group commander, is actually TDY right now. And, um, and, and I thought he might appreciate the fact that I'm sitting in his chair here. Mm -hmm. I know he loves it when, when people come in his, his conference room and they take a twirl in his chair. So <laughs> I'm doing that just for Bear this morning. So. All right, <clears throat> so anyway, Sergeant Klein, welcome to Freeform Friday. Hey, uh, you've, been, you've been up to a lot. You've got uh, amazing things going on. Um, can you just introduce yourself real quick? Tell us where you're from. Tell us about your family members. Absolutely, my name is Stengel Sergeant Klein. I'm a military training instructor. I work over the 321st Training Squadron. I grew up in uh, kind of throughout the Midwest, Wisconsin down to St. Louis, Missouri, and then joined from there. Uh, just joined because the recruiter made it sound kind of cool. And I kind of, <laughs> You got, a, you got a good deal, though. You had a great recruiter experience, right? Oh, yeah. He ended up uh, getting me a job I wasn't expecting. I ended up being a pavements and construction equipment. Uh, AKA Dirt Boy. Dirt Boys. Dirt Boys for life. And uh, went out to build some runways and stuff, and then wanted something a little more uh, blue, focused on the Air Force and leadership, and came down here. was really happy to get this, this career. And uh, yeah, now I'm training, training trainees and trying to set up that next generation for those dogs. That's awesome. We were sitting here this morning, uh, myself, Chief Butcher, Sergeant Klein, we all realized that we are we are all engineers uh, by trade. I'm a CE officer, Sergeant Klein's a dirt boy, and, uh, and, and Chief Butcher is, uh, in addition to training, he's got a background as a high voltage electrician. So pretty cool that we're all sitting here this morning. We didn't even realize they're all sitting here in the training pipeline, it's awesome. Hey, Sergeant Klein, um, you uh, are here this morning for a couple different reasons, one, you were recognized as a distinguished graduate from the NCO Academy. Congratulations, man! That is a huge accomplishment. I asked him about it. He's like, oh, you know, it was means uh, to military training instructor, instructors. What a big deal that is, and what you had to go through to become a blue rope. Absolutely, uh, a blue rope. Uh, for starters, it's a blue cord that we wear on the hat, but it's not just that. You're recognized as a master military training instructor, and what made me want to pursue it is seeing those that wore it already before me, and being like, I want to be like them. Uh, they're some of the most amazing NCIs I've seen, and I wanted to be like that. Blue Rope is really a mentor within their community. Uh, they're recognized, not many jobs have one, a, a spot where you are recognized for being a master of your craft. Um, throughout the Air Force, it's kind of like more rank, you have more responsibility and, and expectation, you have more understanding of the job. Um, here's an NCI, it's awesome because you can go out and you can prove yourself, you get to do these evaluations, and you get to prove yourself to yourself and to your wingmen that you are in the top 10%. And the rope is really, it's not an accomplishment, it's more of a duty type. It's that people can see you and that they know that they can go to you for questions and it's, it's a heavy responsibility yeah. and one that I'm excited for. Yeah, yeah, but again, don't undersell yourself, man. It took a lot of work to get there. Um, it, and no, nobody made you do it either. Like you did it, you took it of your own volition, of your own motivation. Uh, to do it, so man, good on you, good on you. We we get a chance to go to the Blue Rope Ball uh, once a year. We went this year, and all the Blue Ropes from years past come in all the way back to the '60s, man. So that is a uh, that is a very distinguished group, uh, and so welcome to uh, welcome to being a Blue Rope. Man. Congratulations, Chief. Any thoughts? Yeah, congratulations again, Sergeant Klein. I'll tell you what, I'm hearing a common theme, sir. <laughs> you know, NCO Academy distinguished graduate. You know, no more than the top 10% of that class, right? The uh, usually a couple hundred uh, NCOs that, uh, that go through an NCO Academy class uh, from all over the command. So no more 
out of 10%. It's based on your academic uh, rigor, right? How you, you perform on your tests and projects, but as well as your peers. There, you know, there is a peer leadership uh, uh, piece that comes into who is actually awarded a distinguished graduate. So, and then look at you now, right? You know, the blue ropes. Again, a, a top, no more than the top 10% of your MCIs, right? So that's a huge accomplishment, man. I'm very proud of you. And I think what you see, right, MCO Academy prepares you for leadership, right? So your peers and your your instructors there, they look to you and, and saw leadership, right, team leadership. And now look at you in the MCI career field, team leadership again, you know, being at Blue Rope signifying, hey, this is an MCI I can come to you, discuss answers, discuss, you know, guidance that I need, right? So uh, well done, man. Don't, yeah, absolutely, sir. You know, nothing to, to shake a stick at. That is huge, man. Very proud of you. Yeah. Well done. Yeah, no, we're, we're proud. I know the 321st training squadron from Merkel and that and that team there. I know they're super proud of you. And, it, and as an engineer, you know, I just want to say thanks for making us all proud too. You make us so great. So, cool. hey, the other thing I wanted to talk to you about this morning is charge quarters for uh, RPQI. And I won't get into that acronym, but RPQI is basically when we have to set aside our trainees that are in training because of COVID concerns. Uh, and sometimes while they're out of sight because they're not in the, in the normal training environment. Um, it's, it, it, it would be, if it wasn't for people like Sergeant Klein, uh, easy to kind of forget about them. But you haven't done that. I mean, you've made sure that those trainees are taken care of. You want to talk about a little bit about your experiences in charge quarters over at RPQI and, and supporting that mission? Absolutely. Um, so I think everybody knows COVID has given us a lot of challenges. And VMT hasn't stopped. We've been pushing through, and we've been making it work. And RQPI is a, a huge factor in that. Um, being able to put the trainees in an environment that's gonna reduce the spread and still focus on training. They're, we give them study guides, they, have, they spend time studying, um, they're still hitting certain exercises, I won't go into yeah, specifically yeah, the details yeah, of it, yeah. but they'll be exercising, they'll be doing studying, and the staff over at RQPI is doing a great job of getting them in, and then once they're healthier, once they determine safe to return, uh, getting them back out to training. Because really, even with these challenges, the majority of our trainers are graduating on schedule, which is really the goal. It's so, uh, it. Yeah, so we're, we're graduating 90% on time rate, despite <clears throat> about 15% of our population uh, having to be set aside just for a, a short period of time. But we just want you to know at home that they're being, you know, we're, they're being cared for. Um, we have folks like, uh, training instructors like Sergeant Klein and our charge quarters that are, are permanently assigned to take care of them and meet their needs. And, you know, you come in, think about it. You're an 18-year-old kid. 18-year-old uh, young young person, I should say, kid is not the right word, young person comes in and they're ready to train, they're ready to start their lives and lo and behold they get into training and all of a sudden they find out, hey, um, you know, there's been some COVID concerns so we got to kind of set you over here for two weeks. The mental the mental uh, piece of that is huge, um, not only for them but for their instructors because their instructors <coughs> like having their trainees with them, right? That's what instructors do. And when you separate those trainees out from their instructors, it creates stress on the trainee and the instructor, and nobody likes that. So we've worked very hard to kind of revise our operations, but I also just want you to, so that we don't have to do that as often, and we're not doing it as often as we once were. But I want you to know that folks like Sergeant Klein are uh, absolutely uh, focused and making sure that your your sons and daughters and your family members are being well cared for, uh, and that they're getting through training process. Chief, any thoughts? Uh, absolutely, sir. So I can definitely, I shared this last week, you know, I can definitely empathize with all the parents out there. And I want you to know, I, I'm one of those parents, right? I, I saw my son, my oldest son uh, joined our Air Force in uh, uh, last year, uh, right before the COVID pandemic. So he was here uh, during the, the early onset of the pandemic, going through basic military training. But the one thing I found comfort in, um, I know what we're part of. Right? I, I've been in the Air Force for 25 years, and I knew that there was NCOs and, and leaders down here making decisions uh, to the benefit and the welfare of the entire team. No airman is left behind. Nope, and that is in our Airman's creed, right? That is on the fabric of our DNA. We will take the absolute best care of every individual under our charge. So uh, I found comfort in that as a parent, my wife as well. Uh, we were stationed in Japan at the time, so we were thousands of miles away from San Antonio, but we knew our son was being cared for in the best possible manner that, uh, that the Air Force could provide, and every resource would be made available to make sure, number one, yes, he's through, coming through basic military training for a reason. He can become a lethal and ready airman. He can be a warrior. We knew that that was going to happen, 
because it goes like start to climb. But when that pandemic came in and rattled our whole world, I also knew that he was going to be cared for. He was going to be fed properly. He was going to be taught properly. He was going to be checked in on frequently. He was not going to be out here on his own. Um, so yes, sir, I just kind of that parent uh, side of me. Yeah, yeah. Are you a parent certified by chance? No, sir. Not yet? Well, so yeah, I'm a parent of three as well, and I also have uh, my, my son, my oldest is one that's spoke to Citadel, so um, a little different, but but a lot of the same feelings and a lot of the same sentiment. So we don't ever take that for granted. So anyway, hey, thanks thanks for what you're doing, man. Just keep up the great work. So hey, just a couple other topics, Sir Klein, you can jump in here if you want to talk. Hey, um, we've got uh, one thing I wanted to point out to our permanent party personnel is those beaver fit boxes are out there. I've been driving around. I've noticed they're getting some use now um, in a in a pandemic environment where we can't always get together and we can't always. Uh, work out physical fitness and physical readiness is still a big part of our culture and who we are. And so uh, big thank you to Second Air Force and, and my boss, Major General Cullis, who bought us Beaver Fit boxes. And we have them placed all over the wing, including uh, one each for uh, each of our BMT training squadrons. And we actually have gone out back to her and asked her to see if she can cover about seven more of those things. So they're getting a lot of use. Uh, have you had a chance to use one by chance? Absolutely. You have, really? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, tell yeah. me about your experience. So in our unit, uh, there's a whiteboard on the inside, and it's, it's the best tool. Uh, our PP Supply actually goes and they put up kind of like a workout of the day. Most days, uh, they get up there, they put a workout of the day, and people sign their names at the bottom if they've done it. So it's a pretty nice challenge from one instructor to another. Okay. And being out there in the training environment, it's good for, I think, the young, the new airmen to see their instructors out there with that, with that motivation for fitness. It's not just you know, getting by in PT. It's about trying to be healthy, trying to uh, push yourself further. That's great. Hey, Mar I love to hear that, that, that you guys uh, are finding the, the utility for those. And uh, General Tolis, ma'am, hey, there you go. You asked, you wanted to hear straight from the, the horse's mouth. Here it is. They are absolutely using them. Uh, and, and please send more, ma'am. All right, great. Okay, so I uh, also wanted to talk about our unit effectiveness inspection. Uh, <coughs> as we've mentioned on a, the past two Freeform Fridays, uh, we had a big uh, inspection from the Area uh, Education Training Command Inspector General. We got back our report card yesterday and overall effective, uh, which, is, which is great, and effective in uh, all major, gra uh, major graded areas, including three uh, highly effective areas. So um, that report went up to uh, our, all our Boss Journal web yesterday. We're super excited about it, and uh, I just want to say congratulations to all the Warhawks. That's because of you. That's all the time and energy and the work that, that you put into it. Well, the Commander's Inspection Program and AFI 9201 uh, it says that it's a two-year cycle. It is. And we're not gearing up for one single event, but anytime you have 40 members of the IG coming on your installation to, to look at your books, it's always, uh, there's always a little bit of anxiety that goes into that, and there's always some build up to it. But the team was great, we enjoyed it, and we did great. So congratulations, Warhawks, to all of you. Yes. Okay. All right, so um, we also had the opportunity to have a, a, a quarterly honorary commander's call yesterday which I hosted with all our honorary commanders. We had about 30 participants between our commanders and our honorary commanders. Had some great discussions. I just wanted to say thank you to our public affairs and to all the honorary commanders. There was a lot of great discussion. My honorary commander, Mr. Randy Termier, uh, who has been very passionate about our program, has developed some charters that we're going through. And we're actually, instead of just saying, hey, our honorary commanders are parts of their team, uh, come to our events, and we'll, we'll you know, have a nice relationship. We're actually finding ways uh, to have operational impacts and actually do things where the community can support us uh, in the ways that they can. And we're finding some big things. One example is our drive program. I'm not sure if you've heard of the drive program. The drive program is a program where our, uh, our trainees that come in that may not be able to continue on in service for one reason or another, uh, we're actually trying to work to find outside employment either through uh, Air Force Civil Service or uh, work now through the public sector. And our honorary commanders were just uh, super excited about the potential prospects of getting trainees because a lot of our trainees already have great educational background. They have high ASFAB scores. They're a desired, uh, they're a desired commodity. And so to be able to take those young men and women that are trying to start their lives that may not be right, quite right for the Air Force and give them opportunities out there, it's super exciting. And so I, I just want to say thanks to everybody who's part of that. We're gonna keep making some, some major headway on that. So. All right, also, uh, I wanted to provide an update. I had the opportunity to go uh, to what we call the, uh, the SAG, which is, uh, uh, I'm 
trying to, I forget what the acronym is, I'll think of it here in a minute, but basically it's where all the senior leaders take a look at major construction that's going on on our base, and specifically we're talking about the construction of the new BMT campus that's going up right now. So for those that aren't aware, that, 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 uh, that don't get on base, there are new facilities as you drive along uh, Trumper uh, Avenue here on, on Lackland, you'll see new construction going up in a big way. Those are all our new basic military training facilities to complement the four airmen training complex the newer facilities have here to replace our old recruit housing and training dormitories uh, and training facilities that are, um, uh, that are over by the Valley High Gate. Uh, right now, we have uh, two different ATCs that are in construction and one uh, dining and classroom facility. And real quick, I wanted to say that ATC 5 and DCF 3 is scheduled to be completed and hopefully moved into in June of 2022. So that'll be the first part of the construction. So that's ATC 5. ATC 6 is scheduled to be completed right behind that one, November 22nd. They're kind of racing to see which one, two separate contracts, but kind of racing to see which one's going to get finished first. Uh, ATC 7, which will be over on the other side, that'll be the third one. That'll be completed in March of 2024. And ATC 8 and DCF 4 will be completed in June of 24. The other really cool news is that we got approval now. Uh, we got word that uh, a new Airman's Chapel has been approved for future construction. That will be done in, let me get the date, October of 2026. So new chapel, Airman's Chapel here, in addition to that. So anybody that was interested in a construction update, there it is. We also have a major, major uh, modernization effort going for uh, one of the older RHTs that will, will serve for a short period of time, likely our 324 training squadron. That will be done by November of 2021. It's right across the street from where the 324 is right now, building 955. And so they've been on target uh, for a while now to be finished. That had some delays initially in that project, but 2021 is when that was scheduled to be completed. So uh, a lot of good reasons to be excited. Uh, and then uh, we talk about you know superior performers like Sergeant Klein. We have our annual awards banquet coming up here, uh, and it'll be a virtual banquet, unfortunately, because uh, because of the current environment we're in. But uh, that'll be coming up on 19 February 1400 to be able to uh, recognize all our annual award winners. So that's pretty cool. So um, with that, Chief, unless you want had, had anything or Sergeant Klein, you had anything you want to jump in on? I just wanted to get some of the words out there. Oh, I'm sorry. Also, I, I would be remiss if I didn't thank uh, Brigadier General Bailey. Peter Bailey, who came in here. He is General Tullis, the Second Air Force's uh, Guard Advisor. He came in here and spent the day with us yesterday. Um, his boss, his, his previous boss, uh, General Weishar, was actually the officiator and the speaker at our basic military training graduation where the 322nd Training Squadron graduated, uh, graduated their trainees yesterday to become airmen and they're actually shipping out today. So um, thanks so much to General Weishar for coming in and doing that. Thanks so much to General Bailey. General Bailey also hosted, in addition to coming and visiting us and looking at basic military training and learning more about our wing, he also hosted a DNI diversity and inclusion town hall, and we got some really great thoughts. General Bailey has been up serving as part of at the Pentagon as part of the, the diversity and inclusion task force, and so for him to bring that perspective to our wing and actually the special warfare training wing and share some of his thoughts on different corporate initiatives, different Air Force initiatives on diversity and inclusion was really amazing to hear that perspective. So thanks again, General Bailey, uh, for that. We really appreciate it, sir. And I think we have some questions and answers here. This will, this will be uh, the part where Brittany uh, is gonna, gonna jump in here and give us, give us some questions this week. Yes, sir. So most of these are related to civilians from whenever you did your all calls, um, so your civilian all call. Okay, great. Yes, sir. So the first one is, can we self-nominate for wing awards or must it come up through squadron and group? Chief, you wanna yeah. tackle that one? I'd be happy to uh, tackle that. So thank you for your, for your question. Uh, so recognition program is, is very important to us, uh, you know, whether you're squadron, group, wing, leadership, because uh, we want to recognize folks, right? We want to recognize the team's accomplishments and celebrate our, our folks, right? Um, so self-nominating, uh, not necessarily. Um, it really goes through that process of the squadron, group, wing, uh, boards. But uh, what I would offer to you on the self-nominating piece is, um, if that's something you're interested in, if you're like, hey, you know, I think uh, I've done some good work and, and I'm interested in, you know, what, what's the possibility of, of being nominated? That's really uh, for the supervisor, right, to actually generate a package, um, uh, Air Force Form 1206, whether you're a military or a civilian employee, um, and, um, you know, thinking through the whole airman concept, right, which is, you know, 
the most important piece right, that you can set yourself up for is mission accomplishment, right? You gotta do that bang up job for the unit, right? That task that you've been assigned, and once again, military or civilian, you know, what's in your PD or what's in your job description and, and uh, you know, knock that out, take it care of the team. Um, and then, you know, when you start thinking about whole airman concepts, start getting into education, what are you doing to advance yourself and give the Air Force return on investment, to give your team return on investment? So, uh, but I, I'll tell you, you don't even get into that, right? I don't even, as a chief, right? I don't even look at those type of bullets until I see first mission of impact on mission. Yeah. Always Absolutely. impact on mission, always first. Uh, and then second, whole, second is uh, self significant self improvement, community events. Um, what it comes down to is doing things at times that transcends your job description, transcends your what's in your position description. Um, that's certainly not the most relevant thing. The most relevant thing is how are you doing in the job. Uh, but I would I would encourage you if you are interested and you think you're deserving of an award, absolutely have that conversation with your supervisor. Um, and then supervisors, conversely, you, sh you should be talking to your airmen, uh, to those that you supervise about the awards program and the awards process. So there's a general awareness. And there's a comfortable conversation because if it's uh, if it's always uh, kind of under underlying, there's maybe tension behind it. Hey, who's getting nominated? Who's not? Then then you might want to look at the way you're conducting business. I think uh, our airmen should be comfortable having those conversations, and I think we should do it in a very transparent way uh, as supervisors. So I encourage you to do that. Brittany, what what else you got this morning? Yes, sir. The next one is what are the qualifications to be nominated for a wing award? Yeah, I think. I think we just kind of laid them out there, right? So direct mission impacts first, full airman concept. Are you doing things beyond just your mission description? Are you doing things beyond your position description? Are you doing things outside of your core set of responsibilities? Those will help. They're not the most important thing, um, but but you know, what are you doing to make your organization better? And what are you doing to make the mission better? What are you doing to lean forward to to be proactive and not just reactive? You know, those are the types of things. Yeah, the only thing I would add. So, well, two things I'd like to add. Number one. We do have a 37 training wing uh, guide, right? So, you know, outlines categories and then that, that piece I mentioned a few minutes ago about the Air Force Form 1206, it tells you how many bullets you need, that kind of thing. There is a little bit of difference between military and civilian uh, categories on that. But the, and the second piece I'd like to add when, with this, this, this specific question about qualification, you know, it's probably pretty obvious, right? If somebody's in trouble, you can't be nominated for an award. Uh, but, you know, this also, right, think about military members specifically, conditions of employment, right, PT, you know, um, that, that, that would be something that would totally, you know, knock you out that quarter, right? Uh, so this, it's, it's very, very, very fraction of a percentage of our entire population, but I just kind of wanted to, yeah, you know, strike a chord. Yeah, thanks, Gene. Yeah, you know, our awards, it, it, it can be... They can be looked at in a positive way, and supervisors, I'd ask you to do that. Cause, but they could also, let's be honest, be looked at in a negative way as resent those that resent not, not receiving awards, or they resent the others that are receiving awards, and that's really a shame. I, I mean, you can go through life and look at life that way, but the bottom line is, um, is you know, be happy for those that are winning awards. These are amazing people. The competition is incredibly tough, and so uh, never forget about that. So um, just do the best job that you can. Focus on what you do. Focus on your, your relationship with your uh, supervisor and with the rest of uh, your students, and everything will be fine. You know, so. Yes, sir. The next question is, why don't you have a civilian non-supervisor category for GS-11s? Yes, yeah, so we do. Uh, so category three uh, is absolutely, it's meant just exactly for that reason. So we do have that, uh, that category. Um, I wanted to go back to Chief's point on the, on the awards guide that we have that's out there. Um, you can learn a lot more from reading that guide. I'm going to throw his name out there whether he likes it or not. Mass Sergeant Cody Flieger. If you have any questions, just go to Global and send an email to Mass Sergeant Cody Flieger and he will make sure you get a copy of that guide. You can always ask your, your commander support staff and your, your unit, but Flieger, F-L-E-E-G-E-R, Cody Flieger, Master Sergeant. Uh, I like that. That place great. Uh, so, so send him an email and he'll send you the guide. Absolutely, 100%. Yes, sir. And the final question is, is it mandatory for supervisors to submit at least one of their personnel for an award every time there is an opportunity? Sergeant Flieger, or Sergeant Flieger, geez, I got it already. Sergeant Klein, are you, you supervisor? Have you been a supervisor? At yes, sir. Of course you have, right? So is it mandatory for you to submit your airmen, your subordinates for quarterly awards? Um, you have to do it. 
So definitely not. Um, if I've had a lot of airmen that have been performing and I've been trying to hit it, and if an airman is especially stepping up, but sometimes there's quarters where uh, maybe there's some struggles in the unit, maybe people haven't been hitting it super hard, and, that, and that's all right. You know, we all go through ups and downs. Um, but there have definitely been times that uh, there just hasn't been somebody um, that's really stood out. And uh, really all you do is you, you take the feedback, you get the feedback on that, and, and you push harder and uh, get ready for that next quarter. That's true. So, so Sergeant Klein is very articul articulated very well. The answer is no, there is no requirement. However, a good supervisor in a high-performing, high-function unit, which is, which is the propensity in the large part of our wing, uh, to his point, this, they should, uh, they should consider that very closely. Because not only is it, um, does it tell the rest of the organization that this is a superior performer, it's very critical to the morale and welfare of our organization. It keeps people motivated, honestly. You can tell by, by these questions alone that there's a high interest in awards and being recognized. And we want our airmen, big A airmen, when I say big A airmen, I mean all members, civilians, military, even our contractors, we want them to strive to be the best. And if the, the quarterly awards and the annual awards programs is uh, what motivates them, then by all means, absolutely. Supervisors, commanders, superintendents, flight chiefs, all the way down, you should absolutely use the quarterly awards award program as right. Correct. Yeah, so, yeah, just one thing too to add. I mean, I do want to go back to something I sped over earlier, right? You know, uh, this specific question, agree, uh, it's not a mandatory, it's not a check clock that every supervisor has to nominate someone. It has to be merit-based, right? And then the thing is, I, I mentioned a few minutes ago, right? The, an individual award is a reflection of the entire team's accomplishment. It, it's really about celebrating our people, right? And uh, you think about this, in the military, and again, this applies whether you are a contractor or a NAF or an AP, uh, APF, you know, DS, WG, civilian, employee, um, or active duty military, reserve, guard, you name it. Soldier, sailor, airman that we have under this 37th training room construct. Everything we do, everything we accomplish is done by the work of a team. We accomplish very, very little as individuals, but we everything is accomplished by a team. The military is not an individual sport. This is a team sport. Uh, thanks, Chief. All right, uh, I think that, is that the end of our questions? Do we have any live questions? Yes, sir, that's gonna wrap it up. All right, so we, we have gone probably a little long, but that's because we, we enjoy doing this. Uh, sorry, fine, you know, I got a little hard work for you. If you got a second, hey man, keep up the great work. Uh, this is COVID safe, it's got the plastic, you can pull it, fill it right off. Thanks so much for what you're doing for our wing, for our trainees. Thanks. All right, with that, we are out. Warhawks train to win.